Right, well, good evening and welcome, everybody. Um, before we actually find out what did happen in Belgium, um, we've just got the usual trailers to announce. First of all, if you haven't already done so, can you please make sure your mobile is switched off or in silent mode? Thank you. And if the fire alarm should go, then again, please leave quickly as you can, either by the fire exit at the back, which will be lit up, or this one here by me at the front. OK, we've got quite a few trips and talks coming up over the next few weeks. The first one, um, which was just over a week's time on the 26th of October with Andrew Johnson, there's good news and bad news. Good news is it's fully booked. So the bad news is, if you haven't booked, I'm afraid you've missed it this time round. Um, but for those who have booked, it's two o'clock in the Holden Room at Acton on 26th of October. Shortly after that, on the 29th of October, we have a trip, the Green Line Experience, where you can ride on Route 715 from Hartford to Guildford on CL4. Um, the trip departs from Hartford East at 930 or if you can't get to there for that time of the morning, it will go from Wood Green Underground Southside Bus Stop at 10.40. We then have an additional event, which isn't on our website at the moment, but on Tuesday the 31st of October, we've been kindly invited to attend an Omnibus Society meeting, and the subject is the trick of making, of making London buses feel more like a treat. Now, I think that's going to be some trick, actually, but um, there we go. The speaker is Tom Cunningham, Cunnington, and Tom is the head of business development at Transport for London, and he tackles a challenge for all bus operators on how to make bus services more attractive. The venue is the Alan Baxter Gallery, which is downstairs at 70 Cowcross Street, London EC1M6EJ, which is close to Farringdon Station, and it's uh, 6 o'clock for 6.30. What I'll do, actually, is I'll ask Jim Jones to put the details up on our website as well, so if you wanted to go, you, you can refer to it back then. Then, four weeks tonight here at Covent Garden at 6.15... Leon Daniels will be along to speak to us. Um, he's had to cancel a couple of times, so it's really great that he can come and talk to us. And he's going to do um, a presentation on his preservation interest <coughs> and also his World Transport Link. So I think that's going to be a fascinating event, and I will commend early booking if you wanted to come along to that one. And so, to the main event. Our speaker tonight, Andrew Braddock, I don't think really needs no, any introduction. He's known to many of us through his involvement with the Friends and also his organised trips. Andrew had a distinguished career at TfL, where, amongst other jobs, he was the head of the unit for his disabled passengers, and I know all in quite a lot of innovation in that area and took it forward. He's also held a number of directorships relating to transport mobility light rail, and one that I didn't know about that came up, he was on the uh, UK Bus Driver of the Year Association for many years. But his long life interest is in trams, and tonight he's going to entertain us with It Could Only Happen in Belgium, Part 4, 150 Years of Trams in Antwerp. So can we give Andrew a warm welcome, please? Thank you, Graham, and it's just changed to lady and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, you stole my thunder, Graham, because I was going to hold up this and say if you've got one of these and it rings within the next hour or so, you'll be paying for my next trip to Belgium. And the really good news is if the two of them rang, you could split the cost 50-50. So, uh, welcome. I hope that you'll find this interesting, and if you don't, you must complain, because I do like complaints. Here we are, 150 years of trams in Antwerp. This, one of the more modern cars, was running around for some months beforehand uh, in an all-over advertising strip. Some of the windows covered, unfortunately. I wouldn't allow that. Uh, to let everyone know what was happening on Sunday, the 28th of May, this year. Uh, it's the fourth such event that I've given presentations on, 
and in case you're confused, the other three were firstly the Union Internationale des Transports Publics, the Worldwide Public Transport Association, based in Brussels, which marked its 125th anniversary in 2010, where there was a fabulous event, largely between the Tram Museum, if you know it, in Volovay, and the terminus at Tervuren, with an eclectic mix of trams, old and new. I think the oldest there was a Paris car, which last operated in 1937. So there it was in 2010, running for the first time. Its resistance boxes on the roof got very, very hot. Smoke was coming out of them. So every hour, this old Paris tram was shunted into the uh, museum siding to have a rest, and then it went round again. But it did keep going, but it was a superb event. I think in many ways encouraged by that, um, the tram museum people especially, working with the undertakings in Brussels and the other cities, has gone nap, as it were, on continuing these sorts of great shows <coughs> with lots of historic cars running, with people able to travel on them. So we had 150 years of Brussels trams and therefore Belgian trams in 2019. Fortunately, <coughs> it missed the pandemic by a year, <coughs> and that was extremely well attended. Uh, I think they reckon there were about 300,000 people attended, probably 25, maybe 30,000 of which could be classed as tram nuts, and the rest was the ordinary people coming out for a fabulous event. The third such event, which I presented on last year, was the 40th anniversary celebration of the Tram Museum in Brussels, Musée des Transports Urbains Bruxellois, which was another great event with uh, many of you, I'm sure, will have been there with a great mix of trams old and new. So tonight we're talking about Antwerp, and I can put you on notice that there'll be another presentation, if the friends will have me, sometime next year, because Ghent is marking 120 years of its tramways. Word about Belgium. Um, one of my favourite countries, it holds a number of records. Uh, I think the best record is having gone 17 months without a government, whilst talks of former coalition were going on, and in those 17 months, the economy improved. <laughs> so why do we need governments? You could ask yourself that question pretty seriously in the UK. Um, here on the left, of course, you see the little green spot. Let's see if this fancy thing works. Yes, look, here we go. Here's Belgium uh, on the scale of Europe. The lighter green, of course, is the EU. Sadly, without uh, one part of the British Isles involved in it anymore, which is a tragedy. Uh, this is the flag, of course. And this is the flag of the EU, because, of course, the headquarters of the EU is in Brussels. Belgium, although a small country with a population of about 11.3 million, is complex. Um, and it's always been complex. It was created, allegedly, in a barber shop in 1830, when the uh, Spanish were quite keen to get rid of their interests in the Low Countries. And the Dutch didn't really want the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, and the French didn't really want the French-speaking part of Belgium. So they made it into a country, and it became a constitutional monarchy, uh, and, of course, a standard European-style democracy. Um, what's interesting about it is that it's always had this split, more or less, across the middle between the Flemish and the Walloon parts. Um, I think it's also interesting that if you go back to the time of the Balkan Wars and the crisis in Yugoslavia, there were many, many Belgians, and I have probably two or three hundred Belgian friends, who were beginning to worry that perhaps this would eventually lead, as the idea of these separatist nations came across the continent, to Belgium dividing. I personally don't think it will ever happen for a number of reasons, um, but they are quite different. The Flemish part is generally the more developed. Uh, there's much more in the way of countryside and farming in the, in the southern part. And, of course, there's beautiful countryside. If you've been to the Ardennes, it's a fabulous region with some great sausages. I can recommend those. Um, from 1830, literally until 1991, the country existed on a kind of federal handouts basis so that if the federal government gave one Belgian franc to... Flanders, it had to give one Belgian franc to Wallonia, and Brussels got one or one fifty at the same time. 
It was only in 1991 with regional government that they created these much more powerful authorities, obviously Flanderen in the north and Wallonne in the south. Um, that really ceased the way in which public transport investment had always gone. Later on in the presentation, I'll talk to you about Antwerp's pre-metro system and how that began. And that was literally a child of this, a franc for you and a franc for the south, a franc for you and a franc for the south. Interestingly, it might not have happened under the newer system from 91, and we'll come back to that too. So at that stage, what's known as Brussels capital region, the brown blob here, capital city, the city population is actually smaller than Antwerp. It's only about 400,000, where Antwerp is well over 500. But of course, it's not just the city of Brussels, it's all the communes around it. So what's known as the capital region is about 2 million. So it's a, a pretty substantial city by European standards. Um, the, the places which still have trams, Brussels itself, Antwerp, Ghent, the coastline from uh, Nocker through Ostend to Dupanne, uh, Charlois, the so-called light metro, which we'll say a word or two about later, and down here in the Ardennes there is a little, it was diesel, it's now battery operated tram line for the caves at Grotte de Hain. Um, Liège is building, slowly, a modern tramway, having lost all its um, lines in the past. That's due to open, underline the word due, next spring. I think I'll believe it when I see it. It's been slow in the making, <coughs> but it will happen. Um, interestingly, in the far east of the country, you have these two patches of German-speaking Belgium, just to add to the complications. It's a great place. Trams in Antwerp. Um, just a few words on the history. The very first uh, horse tram service kicked off in May 1873. That was a private company, but with some backing from the municipality, the city council, and eventually it was made into a larger company, the CGTA, at the start of the last century, and the first electric trams ran in 1902. CGTA became the TAO, Tramwegen van Antwerpen en Omgeving, in '46. Still technically a private company, but with a fair amount of the shareholding in the hands both of the city and the region. Uh, in 1961, we'll come back to this later, a very historic moment, because arguably this was the turning point in trams in Antwerp. They might have gone the way that most of ours had gone by the 60s, and certainly a lot more in France was still going at that stage, but it was rescued. 63, TAO became MIVA. This was a um, combination of region and city as a publicly owned undertaking with more public funding and quite a lot of political direction that hadn't previously applied. 1970, the construction of the pre-metro began. We'll talk about that more later. And the first line opened in 75. In 1983, they completed the pre-metro tunnel under the river, which opened up um, a lot more uh, passenger traffic on the west side of the shelter. In 91, with regionalisation of the government, uh, MIVA merged with other undertakings in the Flemish region to be part of Deline, as the trading name, the Flamse Vervoer Maatschappij, as its legal title. That made a lot of difference, of course, because MIVA in uh, Antwerp and MIVG in Ghent had different colours. Antwerp was largely red, Ghent was largely blue. Uh, the coastal line had always been part of the Vicinal, the SNCV. An amazing network, probably the densest network of secondary rail lines anywhere in the world. I'd be happy to be challenged on that, but I think it was. Literally, you'd find the Vicinal everywhere. Meter gauge, standard gauge, some so-called cape gauge, 1067 uh, millimetres, steam, diesel, electric, massive electrification programme that was still being completed in the 1960s. And then almost all of it was swept away, <coughs> save for the coastal line, the light metro around Charlois, and so on. Um, the penultimate pre-metro tunnel entered service in 2015, it is said that the whole network would be completed in 2026, but the remaining section, which is built and has been built for about 30 years, I think may not open because it's controversial 
uh, in terms of the impact it would have on services. So here we have 150 years uh, to celebrate of trams in Antwerp. The parties who put all this together, the Tram Museum, which has wonderful premises at Gronenhoek, a former tram depot on the east side of the city centre, uh, was the um, leading um, participant. De Line, obviously the transport company, you have to have their authority to run around in lots of old trams with all kinds of strange people driving them. The META is another public body which is effectively the conduit through which funding by the regional government largely, but some federal money as well, goes to preservation of heritage assets, including transport. De Polder Tram, uh, the guys on the coast who did the superb restoration of 9994, we'll see that later. And Tram 2000, if any of you know it, is an excellent little tram, French language tram and bus magazine. Comes out ten times a year. You can buy it from me if you want to. Uh, and they are big supporters of these events and obviously they cover them in detail. The event was centred around the newer parts of the Antwerp network. This line here, number one, there was always a number one historically, but it finished in the 60s and was reopened in about 2015, all the way up to a new park and ride at Luchtbal. Uh, and as part of that development, there was a new line built here to Havenhaus, where there's the old shipping company's headquarters, now turned into an amazing museum and Islandje, which as the name implies, is an island that was formerly Docklands, so it's a bit like parts of the east end of London converted for commercial use. Um, in principle, these lines were used because, as you'll see in a moment, there was a bit of spare space to park up a line of trams as an exhibition, fixed exhibition during the day, as well as facilities to turn them when they were running in passenger traffic around the network. So here you can see uh, from the leaflet, you'll see the cover of that in a moment, what they were up to. So the exhibition was on this section of track, just in here, which in principle is only service tracking. There is a plan to run a regular service along that connection, but it hasn't happened because the city council's run out of money. So conveniently, track there, probably about three quarters of a kilometre, maybe even a kilometre, was available both sides to line up all the exhibition fleet. The tram parade started at the terminus at Havenhaus and operated down and into the island you're turning circuit, which is tracked both ways, so plenty of flexibility there. Uh, then this yellow box, which is effectively from uh, Island Year, down through the city to National Bank and back up, was operating every 15 minutes with historic cars and modern cars for the public to use. For the first time, I think, in all the history of these great events in Belgium, they actually charge fares. Up to now, everything's been free, which I've always said to the organisers, most of whom I know, you're mad. You could make pots of money doing this, and they did. So it was £25 for an all-day ticket covering everything, horse, bus, horse, tram, electric trams, as many riders as you want, or five just for a single uh, journey. And as you can see, there was a service with a horse bus, service with a horse tram, just looping around this area of the island circuit here. And that was all great fun. This is a, in larger scale, obviously, so this grey track is not normally used in service. Line number seven was continuing to turn, as it always does, round that loop, in and among all the historic stuff, which was spread out along the tracks in Londonstraat. Two pieces of publicity were very widely distributed, a leaflet that gave basic information on what was going on, and the second one was a very useful booklet with pictures of all the cars in the parade and historical information on them. And there was a really good website that had all this in English as well. So things kicked off with um, an amazing contraption. I think you have to call it that, really. Uh, a horse bus. And these horses come from a charity that looks after former industrial 
horses. So these technically are horses in retirement. They used to pull brewery drays. Uh, and they, I'm told, that these four house horses had never met each other because they came from different parts of the organisation that funds them. But they seemed to get on quite well, and they did a tolerably good job of pulling the horse bus along. So this was shunted into position on the tram track south of the Harvin House turning loop to lead the parade. It's interesting in that it's a replica of a car actually built in London by Alexander Dodson. And it was one of half a dozen or so for the very first horse bus lines in Antwerp. Uh, and the replica was made not for this event, but for other historical functions that were going on in and around Antwerp at the time. So obviously it was very handy to have in this parade. Beautifully produced machine, very comfortable to ride on, and the horses seemed to enjoy it. Next in line was a, a horse tram, not a genuine one. Unfortunately, they were all lost to scrap merchants uh, towards the First World War. But this is very, very similar to the first horse cars that ran in the city, and it's actually built out of a, a Brussels trailer car um, with lots of cutting and shutting to make it look the part. It's quite flexible because in addition to the ability to be drawn by horses, notice you only need two horses for a tram on rails but four for a bus. It's all about friction. And uh, it can be towed by a towing tram and it was brought to and from the site by one of the work cars rather than the horses who got into a horse box and went home for tea. So a fabulous pair, these two. Um, we were talking to the guy you can just see here, who is an expert horse driver, not necessarily tram or bus, but anything to do with horse-drawn traction. He's someone who gets involved uh, because he has all the expertise of treating the horses and I guess feeding them lots of sugar lumps. Next in line was the first uh, electric tram, more or less in original condition. It was a works car from the 40s, but from 74 onwards it was given to the apprentices in the then tram workshops in Antwerp um, to make it more or less original. You can be picky about some of the things. The motors aren't original, the wheels aren't original, but the look of it is as it would have been when the first electric car service started in 1901. Here it is coming. Uh, everything came from different parts of the city. The tram museum at Gronenhoek probably produced about half. Uh, others came from the workshops around the corner at Punt and uh, and others from the other depots at Hoboken. Um, so everything was assembled uh, with military precision in the right order, at this point heading north towards the starting point so that uh, the event could be run as planned. 305 is the second series of electric cars, originally with open balconies but rebuilt later, um, <clears throat> also converted to a works car, works car and again set aside in the, I think, 60s, probably earlier than 200, and in a very long project, eventually came to be as it is there in pretty much wartime condition. And you can see it's got the typical masked headlight of a wartime operation. Then we have 5351. Um, there was a big batch of cars built in 1903, some but not all of which were modernised twice, 48 and 67. Some of these, when I first went to Antwerp in about 1969, I think, practically half the fleet looked like this. They were, uh, they were still running and still running quite well. Similar uh, type, a little bit later build, built themselves in their own workshops. They had the skills to build complete cars. Uh, originally, this was for one of the regional Vicinal lines, although built by the city tram company, 
and eventually for some reason transferred to the city in 1920 and finished up as a one-man car. The rebuilding at that stage turned it into a single-ended vehicle. By the 60s, Antwerp had become a network entirely with terminal loops, so you didn't need double-ended cars. Lots of interesting discussions in the tramway fraternity <coughs> about the advisability of single-ended cars, terminal loops, etc., etc. I would be heavily in favour of single-ended cars and terminal loops. The more doors you have, the fewer seats you have, the more things you have to go wrong, etc. Plus, of course, the, uh, what I call the Zurich mentality in Zurich. They're always loving to talk to London bus people to find out why every bus in London never seems to get to the terminus. They're cut short for some reason or another. And my friends in Zurich say, with considerable wisdom, of course, we do not do that here in Zurich because we do not have the facilities to turn short of the terminus. And the passengers do not want us to turn short before the terminus. So single-ended loop terminals, please. Uh, this is a motor trailer set, again a rebuild from 1903, modernised, uh, some, some of them were actually modernised three times, and this was in the final condition, still running uh, till about 1966. <laughs> Notice the trailer, almost but not quite low floor, very low slung, with small wheels, um, and it was originally experiment, experimental, to find out the impact on boarding times and stop-dwell times, another of my favourite subjects, uh, with fewer steps, not necessarily no steps. So this, the front car would have had four steps into the saloon. This one only had two, and it did make a difference. 181, um, there was a big programme in the mid to late 30s to modernise the network by having... Um, Better cars with enclosed balconies, with heaters, something we didn't have on buses in London until the late 50s. And more, I suppose, looking the part, but you can see that it's pretty much the innards of a much older car with modern bits and pieces stuck either end. I mentioned um, earlier the impact that PCC cars had in the 1960s. I'm sure you know the story, the President's Conference Committee of the Street Railroads of the United States in the 1920s got together to create a new kind of streetcar, tram to us, that could compete with the motor car. Streamlined, fast, efficient, automation as far as possible, um, very fast acceleration, etc., etc. That was the PCC. Some 5,000 were built in the United States, some of which still run in San Francisco and Philadelphia and Boston. Um, but that number was eclipsed by the quantities built in Europe and indeed in Russia under license. The Russians didn't pay the license fee, but they copied the PCC technology. Um, the Belgians, theirs were built, and the Dutch PCCs were built by uh, BN in Bruges, La Bourgeoise et Nivelle, which eventually became part of Bombardier, and they dutifully paid the license fee. <clears throat> I'm sure if you've been to my presentations before, you will know the story that the United States government in the 1990s, maybe the early 2000s, was closing down what was called the Transit Research Corporation, which was the body to which license fees were paid, and they were horrified to discover some millions of dollars sitting in the accounts, and even more horrified when they discovered that most of it had come from communist countries. Bit of a scandal. Uh, that was Tatra, of course, the Czech tram builders, with their T-series PCC-type cars, were exactly the same as these and the same as the American ones, and they paid all the license fees. So uh, 2000 was the first of what became an ultimate total of 166. Very much European-style bodywork compared to an American PCC. They had American lookalikes in The Hague, as you will know, and some on the Vicinal that ended up in uh, Belgrade when it was still Yugoslavia. But a very um, epoch-making moment in Antwerp tram history because we could have lost the whole network if 
it hadn't been modernised in this way, with some decent tackle to run. After the first, I think, 50, they realised that passenger numbers were growing, unlike the UK, where they were falling, and they're still growing in Belgium, and they're still falling here. Um, there was a need to put out two cars together, so they went in for multiple unit operation, only ever with two cars, not three like Dresden and some other East German cities. Uh, so a, a big success and uh, something to celebrate. The people loved them. It saved them money on maintenance, but it cost them money on running costs because these things drink the juice like there's no tomorrow. When they finished with PCCs in HTM in The Hague, they were pleasantly surprised that the electricity bill went down by a third. Uh, why? Because they have, in between the two sets of bogies, there's a circular drum-like contraption in the middle of the car, which is the acceleration unit. And it is phenomenally powerful and very, very effective. So this is a shot from uh, the operation of the special service around the city, for those who wanted it, shared between old and new. So here you have the first of the PCCs. Uh, and the newest type, so-called Stadsliner car, built by CAF, the Spanish manufacturer, who are pretty big in tram car production these days. There's a coupled set. Um, the typical Antwerp configuration, very few running single units, the vast majority coupled in all-day service, uh, very fast and very good people movers. This is an oddball. It's actually a PCC from Ghent, where there were no, well, there were some loops, but most terminals were stub ends, so they had double-ended PCCs from the 1970s on 54 cars compared to 166 in uh, Antwerp. Uh, these are running at the moment in Antwerp because they have a line which is temporarily terminated short of the regular destination where there's no loop. So these have been borrowed from Ghent to operate probably until next summer in Antwerp on line 12. So here we are back with the uh, all-over advert tram for the festival. They like, with modern cars, to give them names. So this is the Hermeline. They also exist in Ghent. And they both the Ghent ones and the Antwerp ones run during the summer on the coast to make up the numbers for very high loadings in uh, summer weather. So this Antwerp type is single-ended. The Ghent ones are double-ended, 31 metres long, built by Siemens but with parts from both Alstom and Bombardier. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. A type not quite unique to Belgium because there are similar cars in Dresden, but they're about the only place where these exist. <coughs> Pretty successful. Um, has obviously brought low-floor technology to the city for the first time, and that's helped with stop-dwell times, fewer accidents, etc., etc. Uh, so there are 65 of this type, uh, all in the same length configuration. The next batch to come along from Bombardier, these are arguably similar to the cars in um, Nottingham, and one or two other places, so-called Flex City 2 type, not quite the same as the Flex City 1, which is the Croydon, Cologne, Stockholm type. 62 of these. Some of them are 32 metres long, some of them 43. The 43s are largely confined to the newish main north-south uh, route to the park and ride at Luchtbal. So <coughs> 62 of these, and then mines are changed. Obviously, in the modern world of competitive tendering, you don't perhaps just look at the price, but it's very influential. You also look at build quality aspects, the things that you want in your own personal specification. And bearing in mind that both this new type, the Stadsliner from CAF, and the two predecessor, Albatross and Hermeline, were not just for Antwerp. Hermeline's also for Ghent. Uh, the Albatross also for Ghent. And this type is also for the coast tramway. And in fact, the coastal line, no longer the longest tramway in the world. Gosh, it's been beaten by a combination of lines in Los Angeles, but only by about three kilometres. 
<coughs> so it's still pretty long. And this type in double-ended configuration <coughs> is now running along the coast. And it's replaced all the previous BN types on the coast in the last few weeks. So the design is a kind of a compromise between what they want on the coast, what they want in Ghent, what they want in Antwerp. So you never get 100% of what you really want. But these at the moment, there's 58 of them, are single-ended and 34 metres long. But next year there's a batch, I think it's 28, coming which will be 44 metres long. So they like the idea of longer cars. Uh, incidentally, um, in the background there, the <coughs> I'm going to forget the name of the architect, Haja Abib, female architect, great design. Sadly, she died of a heart attack not so long ago. But she literally plonked this amazing structure on top of the old... I thought I'd got a picture of it, but I couldn't find it. The um, shipping company's offices, which are a beautiful old, almost Gothic-style building. But it kind of works. It looks, looks stunning. Architecture in Antwerp is quite interesting. We'll come back to that. <coughs> Last but not least, I mentioned Polder Tram. This is the Vicinal type of car that ran the lines largely to the north and west of Antwerp up until 1978. So this car was finished on the Antwerp network in 78 and restored by the Polder Tram group. It lives at Nocker on the coast, but it travels extensively. It's been running in Ghent. It's here in, um, in Antwerp, and it went to Brussels <coughs> on a low loader because Brussels is standard gauge for the 150th anniversary there. A really nice tram, very solid, very heavy, but the so-called standard uh, was the biggest type of electric car, at least, running on the vast Vicinal network. Works cars, there were a few works cars in the parade. This one is actually a towing vehicle, uh, the darker yellow at the front, 8826, and it towed the replica horse tram trailer to and from the event. So it had a useful function as well as looking pretty in the parade. Inside the museum, there's a trolleybus. Antwerp had one trolleybus line, the six, that started in 1937, I think, and ran until 66. This isn't actually one of the Antwerp trolleybuses. It's a Liège one, but it's pretty similar. Uh, so it's painted in Antwerp colours to show what it would have been like on the number six. Here's the interior <coughs> of the museum. Gronenhoek was opened in 1903 uh, for some of the first electric tram lines in Antwerp, slightly to the uh, east of Bertram Station, on the way into the city from the south, south uh, east. Um, it's an amazing structure because, as you see, there are no uprights. So unlike Stockwell, where you have no uprights and mass concrete for the pillars, uh, this was a, a massive <coughs> string of steel to make sure no uprights were needed. This is now uh, no longer in use as a service um, facility, so it was given over to the museum, and this was part of the creation of FLATAM, the Flams Tram and Autobus Museum, so that it could have the funding from Meta to take over the depot uh, and have the roof rebuilt, incidentally, that was funded by the regional government because it was very leaky. And this is a fabulous um, arrangement to have connected to the tracks of a big city network a depot full of old cars with facilities to maintain them, lots and lots of volunteers to show people around and drive them and conduct them. So it's a, it's a model arrangement. Also inside, just out of interest, is a gyro bus, a weird idea. Uh, in this box on the roof, there were three prongs that came up to connect with a kind of overhead structure. They haven't got one of those, sadly. You can just see one of the three here. So this had a massive flywheel under the floor, uh, and the idea was that collecting current from these pods energised the flywheel that then ran the bus to the other side of the city. Not a great success. This was actually used on a Vicinal line <coughs> to the east of Antwerp, not for very long. Uh, there was one small network in Yverdon in Switzerland that lasted from about 1956 till 64, I think. 
But the biggest number of them, even then, it was still in, in the tens, was in uh, the Belgian Congo. Leopoldville was blessed with gyro buses for a period, quite a short one, I think, um, during the latter days of the Belgian Empire. I mentioned architecture and the um, main station in Antwerp, Antwerp and Central, is just a fabulous structure. It's like a railway cathedral. Um, I did try and find some interior pictures for you, but they're on another file somewhere. We'll do that another time. But it's a stunning um, piece of architecture. And amazingly, about 15 years ago, they tunnelled completely below this structure to make a new connection because this was always a terminal station from the south and although there was a line going north it avoided central station so you had the crazy thing that the so-called Benelux trains from Brussels to Amsterdam didn't serve Antwerp because there were there was no facility to do so now they do and there's actually three levels you've got the original level uh, here with terminal platforms then there's a through level for local services and at the very bottom uh, through platforms for the high-speed line. It's absolutely incredible. Mention of architecture. Um, this structure on the left is the so-called MAS, M-A-S, Museum an der Strom, a very new facility in Antwerp, uh, very close to the island terminal point. And in fact, on the right is a view down. Here you see the horse tram, which is going around the loop this way. And here you see the horse bus, which was going around the loop that way and coming back. Each ride taking about 10 minutes. Um, absolutely stacked out all day long. Very enjoyable experience. So Mars is uh, great because if you go to the very top, you get a fantastic view all over the city. There's an excellent cafe and it's very accessible. Every, every floor is linked by escalators. So it takes you no more than three or four minutes to get from the bottom to the top. No queuing for a lift. You just keep going up on the escalator. Well worth a visit if you are in the fine city of Antwerp. <coughs> the local newspaper, uh, the Gazette van Antwerpen, produced a very nice supplement. They have a, a weekly supplement called DNA. And this one was dedicated to 150 years of trams in Antwerpen. Um, I laughed at the tingling because I was one of the tingling twins in 1980 when I was learning to drive trams in Amsterdam. Uh, my instructor, Jim Schulte, and I were rolling around the city constantly being monitored by the control room who were looking and we could hear on the radio all the talk of, oh, where are the tingling twins? Ah, they are at Amstel Station. No, no, they are at Herengracht. And they were tracking us everywhere, the tingling twins, so great fun. And you can see in this lovely black and white picture, uh, up until the 1960s, almost all Antwerp trams, and indeed Belgian trams, had seated conductors. We never did that. We always had conductors roving around, <coughs> but with a big platform um, by the doors, the idea was everybody piles on, then they pass the conductor and they buy a ticket, and he just sits there. And he controlled the doors nearest to his position, of course. So it was a great supplement. Uh, and actually, the Gazette also produced a book, about 60, 64 pages, I think, called Tingling, which celebrated the 150th anniversary celebrations. Very good. So a word about um, Antwerp today. Developed over 150 years, this is one of the best networks in Europe. It is a fantastic model example for what the British should have been doing <coughs> and should still do, but I have little confidence that either Tory or Labour governments will ever get this right. <coughs> this network is bigger than it was in the 1940s. It's been modernised, uh, and the core change is the so-called pre netro network, which I'll talk about in a minute. These stations with stars are interchanges on that pre-metro network. So with federal money in the 1960s and 70s, Antwerp started to tunnel, and they tunneled, and they tunneled, and they tunneled. And although this first section from Diamant to Grunplatz was opened in 1975, it was another 12 years before the second section opened, even though the tunnels had been built 
and left empty. The federal money provided for basic tunnel construction, not for tracks, not for overhead lines, not for platforms, not for the vehicles to run in them. That all came separately. So quite sensibly, when there was a Belgian franc for the Flemish and a Belgian franc for the Walloons, Antwerp made sure it got plenty of francs and dug lots and lots of tunnels. Um, the most significant piece of tunnelling, of course, was under the river here is the shelter. You probably know Antwerp is a huge port up here. I think it's the third largest port in Europe, Rotterdam 1, Hamburg 2, Antwerp 3, Le Havre 4. I'm prepared to be challenged on that. I'm not a port expert, but it's bloody big. Um, <clears throat> so all this area is port with the shelter serving it. So this, this tunnel was significant because it effectively reopened part of a Visnal line that went way out to the west. And although this area was green fields and villages, it's all been developed. So our problem with housing is interesting compared to the Belgians. I live in North East Hampshire, where almost all the land being used for new housing is ex-military. So you have the problem that it's full of munitions and that has to be cleared first. Then they discover it's full of all kinds of stuff the army used but never told anybody about, and that has to be cleared as well. And then, of course, you've got 30, 50, 100, 200 houses built in the middle of nowhere. No hope under British uh, practice of a bus service being run because unless stagecoach can make a profit they're not going to do it. Local authorities have got no money to fund it. So for every hundred houses there'll be a hundred cars and probably in the model world there'll be 120 cars. We are stark staring bonkers. What happened here is that lots of new development went in after the tramway had been built. Common practice in the Netherlands when I was uh, learning to drive in Amsterdam, it amazed me that we went every four minutes to a place called Neuschlotten, which was the extension of Tram Line 2 in Amsterdam. And for five years, five years, there were no houses. But the rails were there and the trams ran, empty. Because it's a message that you need to convey. When the first people got the keys to move in, they didn't buy a car, they didn't need a car, because they saw the tram. Every time they came to see the house under construction to discuss what shape they wanted the kitchen to be and where they wanted the bathroom lights to be, there was a tram going past every four minutes. Yeah, it's fabulous, isn't it? We are bonkers. So all of this. But the second um, fantastically successful feature in this city is park and ride. You have a huge park and ride at Luchtbal, at Merksem, at Weinigem, at Wommelgem, at Burghout, at Olympiade, at Schoenselhof, and at, well, there are three now here. There's one at Regatta, Linkerova, and Melsler. Now, it's fascinating. I think Steve was with me when we did this. We were uh, dining at a nice restaurant, I know, at this end here, actually, Hof der Rhein, in the village of Zweindrecht. And we went to get a tram back into central Antwerp at about quarter past 11 at night. And all the trams coming the other way every 10 minutes 44 metres long, were absolutely full and standing, going back to the park and ride. People do not drive anymore in and around this city. And it's, it's wonderful. In fact, most European cities, you walk around and you don't see traffic. You don't see white vans delivering Amazon. You, know, you don't see congestion in the way that we do. We're bonkers. We followed the American model. Drive everywhere. You know, why not? It's free. It's cheap. Yeah. So this is a great place in having uh, virtually no traffic, but everybody gets around. Public transport use has grown consistently, practically exactly the same proportions that it's fallen in the UK. So this, this move to big park and rides has been a great success. There's another one being built here now at Zaud, and there's a plan for a ring line which will come from Olympiada round here with another park and ride here, go up to Relink Vomelgem and then go off into new housing development land in the north east suburbs. <coughs> so um, I strongly recommend it. The other bits of fancy colour on here simply mean tracks are being rebuilt here into the uh, heart of the old city and a beautiful street here with some of the finest architecture in the world, leave alone Belgium and Europe, 
along Planted and Martus. Uh, this is, I think, scheduled to reopen in the spring. So a lot of development is going on. Pre-Metro, uh, as I say, it started with digging from Diamant to Coronplatz before they went under the river. The second piece of tunnelling was around this corner from uh, a place called National Park round to Astrid. The third piece was out here, and this only started to be used in about 2011, I think, uh, and this part was built in the late 80s and eventually opened in the late 90s. This yellow section is tunnels uh, and the station connections to and from street at Stauffenberg and Sylvie de are there, but there's no track and there's no overhead wire. It's controversial because the plan had always been to take one of the lines that follows this axis to go along this axis and then to swap the routes they travel at the end. And it's apparently not popular with the public. I'm not 100% sure why. So it's, it's on hold. And this is what they're talking about, the last section to complete in 2026. There will definitely be no more pre-metro. And there will definitely be no conversion to full metro, <coughs> as happened with some of the pre-metro lines in Brussels. Um, this is because European public transport people learned a fantastic lesson. In the 60s, they thought if they were going to, certainly if they were going to retain trams and modernise them, it made sense to go underground to leave the streets for cars. Ah, bonkers. Uh, they've now realised the best thing to do is leave the streets for tram and get rid of the cars. And that's not been at all controversial in most places. They've done it by stealth in Amsterdam. There was a wonderful campaign where the press were full of stories that they were going to have toll roads. The whole of Amsterdam would be ringed with toll booths and you'd only be able to drive into the city if you paid a toll. And the people rose up, as only the Dutch can, and they're very tall, as you know, and they shouted loud that if the city council did this, they would blow up the toll booths. So the city council said, OK, that's fine. Well, we won't do that. And they, the second plan, which was always plan A, so you introduce something far more controversial to get through what ought to be controversial and in the end wasn't, which was increasing parking charges to the point where they are double the tram fare. And the road network in and around the city of Amsterdam is such that if you drive from point A in the outer suburbs to the city centre, it will take you three times as long as getting on the tram. So what do people do? They get on the tram. So uh, this is, it's, it's interesting, but apart from the obvious need for a tunnel under the river, and I guess under, the main station is literally plonked here between Astrid and Diamant. It's a bit confusing. So when you come out of Central Station right here, depending on whether you're going this way or that way or that way, you either go to Astrid or to Diamant, neither of which is called Central Station. It's a Belgian puzzle. Um, so I guess there would have been some tunnelling under the station to make good connections for through routes, but I don't think any of this would have, been, would have been built. But it's there. It was paid for years ago, and it's now in use, and it's been a massive success, and it's led to more than doubling public transport use. Um, this is interesting because it's a, a very early uh, map, which you can see is kind of familiar with what we've just talked about under the river. OK, the line goes beyond. So this was the tunnel mouth, as it were. This looks familiar. This is the one bit scheduled to open in 2026, etc. But notice this. Um, the plan here was to go on tunnelling all the way to literally Zoud and go tunnelling halfway to the harbour area. Yeah. So what we looked at earlier, this is Islandier, hence the expression. Harvin House is just there, and the park and ride at Luchtbal is way up here. So in the end, they came to their senses and reopened, as it were, line one. The tracks were already here, but some extra bits. But these tracks, which had been removed in the 60s, were put back in a slightly different place to make the new line one, which comes out of the tunnel here, uh, and tunnels its way down to the south. So common sense prevailed in the end. Um, so an interesting 
an interesting tale, a very successful network in modern terms. That's it. If there are questions, I will try and answer them. Yes, can I... Uh... Andrew, yes, sir. I think on your list of tram services, yes, on tram routes in Belgium, you missed one. Yes, tramway to Ristic the Lane. Oh yes, okay. Based yes. at Eversay in the Ardennes. Yeah, I accept that. The good old TTA. Um, now, to be the, honest, I always regard that more as a railway than a tramway, but that's personal. Well, it's got ultra rails on it. Yes, yes. The other thing I would like to say is that the top. The northern terminus of the 24 was used, and you showed lots of pictures of it, to line up all the museum cars for yes. a procession. The service cars, while they were lining up, actually used the non-service track down they to did. Amsterdam Straat. You're quite right, they did. Yep. And thirdly, your uh, picture there of the newspaper, yep. the tingling, yep. I was actually interviewed on, Amps on Antwerp local radio, Ooh. Radio Minerva, whilst waiting for a ride on my favourite tram, which happened to be Vissenal 9994. Yep. And what they did, they asked me the question in English, I gave them an answer in English, and then they interpreted it for the uh, Antwerp listeners. Very fine. Well done, Roger. Um, there's been some recent changes for, for the line as well. I was only there four weeks ago. Um, it doesn't look as though line 11 is going to reopen at all. Um, there's lots of debate within the local press about that. Plus, the tunnel under the, the Skelda is going to possibly closed for six months um, and they're just trying to find possible ways around that by just shutting overnight or whatever but it'll make the works yep. really yep. last two or three years if they do that yeah um, but some of the the actual um, structure the, the like the new opera station is already falling apart yep. um, which is quite worrying that considering the amount of money that has gone into I it. I suspect there might be some rack in there. <laughs> We're not alone in having rack. Um, it's a little bit like the Amsterdam toll booth story. You have to bear in mind that De Line is owned and funded by the regional government, and it has a whole series of standoffs with the city council, one of which is that the city argued there was enough money in the current regional funding <coughs> for De Line to open the line that was going to come up Italia LA and finish at Island Year. Using those tracks would have been pretty inconvenient for the parade, but never mind. Um, <clears throat> but the line say that's not true. The line will, um, <laughs> how shall I put this? They will be quite clever at planting some scare stories, like the 11 closing the tunnel for six months or a year, uh, in order to get some common sense out of people. Belgium politically is a, an interesting place, as I say, not least because it went 17 months and ran quite well without government. Um, there are a lot of tensions over city planning compared to regional planning. They don't always match up. I firmly believe that the 11 will reopen. I think the, um, it's, it's basically relaying the track in the Schelter Tunnel. I think that probably will come down to summer closures for a couple of years, maybe evenings and weekends. You have to do these things, you know. No, no infrastructure lasts forever. <coughs> You're right about the, uh, the state of some of the metro stations is pretty poor. But again, <coughs> it's a function of <coughs> how much money is available. And with uh, the similar pressures that our government's had, oil prices, inflation, etc., there have been cutbacks, so it's fair to say that there's some pretty um, nasty-looking setups that need attention. But uh, the good thing is, loads and loads of people use that system, so 
What's this suddenly putting something here for me? I don't want that. I don't want to mention. No. Um, I was coming back to the, just covering the point that Roger made. The, the 24 obviously couldn't go up here at the point where the parade was being assembled. So it came along here and it turned on the outer loop of uh, uh, Island View. All good fun. No more questions? Thank you, Andrew. Excellent information given. You recall when I was at Kent, Tony Francis here, yep. um, you helped us considerably in planning of Medway Metro, yep. a light rail system through the built-up area of Mid-Kent. It was dismissed by Steer Davis Gleave, I think it was somebody from there. There was no business case for this, and that was the end of it, although we had some delightful trips around Belgium, etc., looking at what they were doing. Um, what was the business case for these? I mean, somehow the numbers didn't add up to the oh, bean counters here. <coughs> um, don't they have bean counters there? Could you? How long, how long have you got, Tony? <laughs> um, this, this is something that fascinates me. Um, take, take Nottingham. Here's a good example. A, a pretty good tramway opened in 2004. Quite a struggle to get it built in the UK with all the strange rules. Um, doesn't carry nearly enough people because the buses compete with it. Why? Because when it was first opened, the private finance initiative um, that gave birth to it included Nottingham City Transport with its part owner, Transdev. Uh, gosh, when they went out to tender, as they have to, the beauty parade for building the two new lines, or line extensions, to be strictly correct, all that changed. Nottingham City ceased to be one of the shareholders, it immediately removed the tramway from its maps and immediately rejigged its network to compete with the tram. And that's allowed, of course, deregulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the really fascinating thing is that the struggle to get funding from HM Treasury for Nottingham <coughs> and any other UK light rail scheme was at least partly stymied by the Treasury's view that if these things were the success there played up to be fewer people will drive so there will be less revenue from fuel tax and fewer people might even own a car so there'll be less money from road tax and you have to factor those two things in in the equation in the Belgian and Dutch system and they're pretty similar French and German are very different but Bel Belgium and Holland are pretty much the same almost the first thing the equivalent of the Treasury takes into account is environmental factors if there are more people using trams and buses, there will be fewer people driving. Tick the box. Yeah? Tax implications, doesn't matter. The environment counts far more than it does here. What have we had? A prime minister who's allowed the biggest oil field in the North Sea at the point where we have a climate emergency, where he's rolled back the date for electric cars, much to the annoyance of the people who build them, who'd been made a promise and the promise is reneged on. You know, bonkers. Um, the... The other huge, huge difference between the UK and practically everywhere in continental Europe is that subsidy is seen as a bad thing in the UK, but a good thing over there, i.e. you make sure the fares are reasonable so that people will give up using their cars because it's a cheaper ride. Um, and it's interesting the extent to which that thinking creates unexpected problems. TfL for the last four years has been in a massive funding crisis <coughs> because when the pandemic hit and everybody stopped using the underground buses, the whole TfL network still running, no passengers. You've got all the costs and none of the revenue. London's um, fare box recovery ratio, public transport people talk about this worldwide, is about 84%. So in other words, 84% of income that comes from passengers has gone. The equivalent of that figure in Paris is 22%. So it's a much less serious problem. And the French government didn't bat an eyelid to fund RATP through the crisis of COVID. But look at the absolute blood on the floor mess between a Labour mayor and a Conservative government. Gosh, we're really good at those things, aren't we? 
I mean, politicians become extremely childish. They're like four-year-olds, yeah? And the thing that amazes me is that Khan has completely failed to tell people, don't complain about ULES. I was going to start it in 2027, but I've been forced to start it sooner in order to get funding for TfL. That's what actually happened. I don't know why Khan hasn't said that. It's a disappointment from an otherwise good mayor, damn sight better than the previous one. So it's a, it's a whole, uh, it's Pandora's box, really, but anywhere you go in Europe, public transport counts for something. In the UK, it's been deregulated, privatised, marginalised, faffed about with, put under different owners. You know, it's, it's rubbish, really. The structure is wrong. A lot of the operation is pretty poor. Uh, and the funding is bonkers. careful now, there's a question from a finance man. Thank you. Um, I think I saw on one of the maps um, a tram stop called Joe English. Do you know if there's any story behind that? Is it the new map? No, it's one of the larger network maps. The whole network? Yes. Later in the presentation. That one? No, that one there. Yes, under Burg. Out. Where are we looking? Uh, on the, there's two lines, a cerise and a pale green line. The green? Yes. And further up. Yeah. Um, about three o'clock. Keep moving. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. North. 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 Um, northeast. Northeast from there. Here. Here. And further here. on. Further on. <laughs> 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 oh, Joe English. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Uh, how long have I got to explain the Belgian sense of humour? Uh, Joe English is a, it's a kind of folklore story that I think is unique to Antwerp. Um, I don't exactly remember the origins, but people will say, you've, you've done a Joe English. And it was reckoned to have come from this, this part here. So, you know, it's a, there's all kinds of funny names you'll find that uh, sort of don't belong. I can't remember where they are now. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Burgermeister Nolf. Nolf was the least popular politician in Antwerp's history. So it's a tram stop named after him, so you don't forget <laughs> that he was the least popular. Yeah. So yes, Joe English, it's fun, isn't it? And there's another one called Drink, yeah? <laughs> Which is not liquid. It's, it's just the name of the local area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any more? Mr. Kearns. This will be a challenging question. I'd better have a drink. Cheers. Um, the point you made, Andrew, about um, transport infrastructure going in um, prior to development, um, which, you know, in pure transport planning terms sounds you know, a really good idea. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you make it work in reality, though? I mean, the, what, the example I can think of in London is the Beckton extension of the DLR, yep. which when, when it was opened, literally some yep. of the stations there had single figures in terms of yep. passenger numbers yep. for the first year or so, I guess, perhaps uh, two years. You, you accept that there's going to be a cost. Um, <clears> the, because I know it best, and I was there throughout it happening, uh, Line 2 in Amsterdam, the extension from Schloten to New Schloten was 2.6 kilometres. Um, the additional cost of running, even at peak hours every four minutes, through a paddy field to the new terminal loop was about one, it was between one and one and a half percent extra cost. So that was just accepted because it's the right thing mm. to do. The big cost came, however, when, uh, oh, you need um, a couple of hours to explain the way trams are scheduled in Amsterdam, but they work on the basis that you get to a point where you have your break and you, you have your break at the terminus and you hand the tram over to another driver who's just finished his break, okay? Yeah. So at every terminal point, there's a coffee house. 
and because this 1.2.6 kilometre extension was going nowhere, the city didn't build a coffee house, and there was a strike. Uh, and effectively, drivers refused to go beyond Schlotten, so there was chaos because, of course, the timetable wasn't jigged for turning at the old terminus. Track was still there, obviously, no problem, and there was a coffee house there. And so, the, the, I mean, two basically went into meltdown. And within four days, a coffee house was built and opened, and the trams were restored. So the, uh, the people in GVB, the transport company in Amsterdam, always have the joke that the, uh, the Line 2 extension, there was a, a very heavy cost overrun because no one budgeted for the coffee house. But they budget for everything else. It's accepted. The Hague is another exemplar. There's lots and lots of new housing south of the city in the Hague towards Delft. Uh, when they built the line to Notdorp, they did exactly the same thing. And in fact, the estate agents who were selling houses in this new area, when you got one of their brochures, the first thing it said was line 15 runs every six minutes. You know, I mean, where would you find that in the UK? Although there is evidence. Um, there's evidence from Manchester, which has been published, that shows the value of housing has increased as a result of Metrolink extension. Similarly, Nottingham. These things will happen... The best thing, of course, is to harness that money. Uh, John, um, my friend from um, TFL, LT, uh, knows well because he was general manager of the Jubilee Line when it was extended, went through a place called Bermondsey, which was a bit of a dump. But there was quite a lot of land <coughs> ripe for development in Bermondsey. And the reckoning is that property developers collectively made about six billion mm -hmm. Pounds that they made as a result of the railway being the open to Bermondsey. Why way. wasn't that money yeah, clawed back? Exactly. Toronto is the best example. They started building their subway system, Metro Underground, call it what you will, in the 50s, and they introduced a new form of tax that as the land values increased, mm. some of the money, I think it was 20%, maybe even 25%, rolled into the city coffers to fund the next line. Yeah. <clears throat> so you go on. The Germans do that through a very different system, complicated, because it's German. Um, but much the same happens in cities like Cologne. They progressively extended their tram, and uh, they have a, a type of pre-metro um, funded from property taxes yeah. along the new lines. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Mm, Why don't we do it? Yeah. We don't do it because... I might be a little bit controversial here. Most of the property developers fund the Conservative Party. <laughs> and Labour doesn't really understand what it's doing yet, but it might. It might. Any more? Oh, yes. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, your usual splendid presentation. If I can add to your anecdotes, I remember when the Stora Belt uh, bridge and tunnel were being planned in Denmark. I happened to be over there with uh, a course from Woking, and we went to talk to the planners of this crossing. And I said to them, how is it that you are anticipating a tremendously fast by UK standards uh, building of this new link to replace the ferries um, you know what does your business case look like what's your cost benefit rate of return and the planner looked at me and he said why would we need that he said it's quite obvious unless we get a modern crossing the island is going to go into economic ruin. And as you know, the island is, is now uh, flourishing again. I'd like to ask you about uh, integration. I expect you were expecting that. Integration in two levels. First of all, the, the service level. How much coordination is there in Antwerp with the mainline railway system and the bus services and even uh, 
because I think they're becoming more widely used now in, um, in continental Europe than they are here, but uh, DRT services run on modern principles with strong IT support. But the second and even more into, uh, for important integration, if we're going to defeat climate change, or at least make it livable with, is bringing together a sensible policy which develops transfer to public transport through coordinated physical planning or spatial planning, coordinated highways and parking management, and of course public transport expansion both at the service level and at the infrastructure level. Done, John? You can try and do that in five minutes. <laughs> um, I need to take you back to 1964. A Labour government was elected in 1964, and not long afterwards, Mrs Barbara Castle became Secretary of State for Transport, if that's what they were called in those days, and it might not have been. Um, and she was on a mission to radically transform Britain's public transport, particularly in urban areas. She was concerned, even back in those days, about the contrast between London and the rest. London, of course, had had since 1933 the LPTB, a public body, everything coordinated, though I would pick holes in quite a bit of that coordination, but we're not here to do that today. Um, and that's what led to the creation of the PTAs and PTEs in the big cities outside London, Manchester, uh, Liverpool, West Midlands and the Yorkshires. Um, the whole effort was based on the MBTE, MBTA, Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority in Boston. And I've always said that that must have been an easy job for civil servants to send Barbara to Boston where they spoke English. They should have sent her to Hamburg where they don't. In exactly the same period, two things were happening. In the USA... 90% privately operated transit systems in cities, largely bus because they'd done away with the streetcars in private ownership, were collapsing. The revenue was gone, everybody was driving. But cities realised they still needed public transport for people that don't drive. Poor people need public transport. So the MBTA was actually created to municipalise all the privately owned bus and rail companies alongside its own publicly owned streetcar system and some early subway lines. Um, as a model, it was the wrong thing for the UK. Why? Because what was happening in Hamburg was the creation of the very first Verkehrsverbunde, literally traffic partnership. <clears throat> in Hamburg, there were 47 different operators of buses, trams, trains, Ferries, you name it, uh, and they were all brought together under one ticketing system. The principle from that far off day back in Germany was that if you've got one of these, you can go anywhere. Yeah? It's sitting in your drive, and you just, in the old days, you put something in the door, now you just click something, or you've got, you've got an app, you know, whatever. Uh, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's absolute emancipation, you can go anywhere. If, in order to use public transport, you have a ticket for the train, a ticket for the ferry, a ticket for the bus, a ticket for the tram, and they're all different and different prices, you are never going to compete with a motor car. So what the Verkehrsverbund did was standardise the tariff. It didn't matter that there were 48 operators, some of them privately owned, some of them state owned, some of them municipally owned, and that did not change. They all had a sticker with HVV, Hamburger Verkehrsverbunder. Nothing else changed. Sadly, what happened with the creation of the PTEs, take Selneck as the best example, South East Lancashire, North East Cheshire. Basically, all the municipal bus companies were swept together and they all became Manchester City Transport, which is a pity because Manchester wasn't the best operator. Lee Corporation was probably the best operator. Stockport was probably the second best. But the concentration 
of that merger, and it was just seen as a merger of all the transport companies, it was about unions and rates of pay. It had nothing to do with ticketing. There were some early brave attempts at coordination, particularly with the railways, very difficult because the railways sing to a different set of tunes. So we failed at that early stage to look properly at integration. Now, if you, I could send you, but it's massive, a very complex map of Germany that shows you every square kilometre of that large country is covered by Verkehrsverbunde. Uh, and there is now a thing called the Deutschland ticket, which for 49 euros a month you can use on any kind of public transport except the really fast intercity train connections anywhere in the land, and it's brilliant. And the French are talking about doing something similar. We'll be 100 years arguing about how you share out the revenue, which is all bollocks. Sorry, pardon my French. <laughs> um, again, it's a, it's a mentality, isn't it? The, the philosophy we should have had, like Germany in the 60s, was, my God, look at what we've done. We've unleashed this thing called the motor car. And like America, we built more and more roads. Now, the difference in the states, anybody driven along Route 66? Yep. So about a third of the mother road still exists. Yep. The rest of it is bypassed, it's moved, because it's a country with absolutely no land problem. So if the road's not wide enough, you just widen it, you know. I mean, we've got, they built a Newbury bypass in 1934, they built a second bypass in the 1960s, and they built a third bypass in the 1990s or 2000s. You know, we're mad. Um, unless you have a ticketing system that <coughs> brings everything together, it's not going to work. In Antwerp, it's simple because since 1991, it's all been one operator in terms of local public transport. You've still got the state railway. So the line has a ticketing system that's valid across the whole of Flanders and so-called tech, transport en commune in the French-speaking part, the Wallonian Transport Company, has something similar. They both participate in a thing called Mobib, which is semi-oyster but with knobs on. Um, with a Mobig card, you can use the train, the bus, the tram, etc. Most people, interestingly, and Belgian railways are quite different from ours, they are uh, much more freestanding in the sense that <coughs> people who commute into, say, Brussels get the train to Central Station or Zad or Nord or one of the other stations because there's a much bigger span of them. And luckily, since 19... 52, they've had a railway that goes right through the middle of the city. You haven't got Victoria, Waterloo, London Bridge, Euston in a ring where everybody goes, oh, you know, where do I go now? You get on a bus or a tram or you take a taxi, etc. So that's helped. So um, the Dutch system is, is better still. The uh, OFE chip cart, open bar for war chip cart. You buy a card, you load it with money. If you're only going to travel around locally, you load it with five euros. If you're going to use the railway, you have to have a minimum 25 euros, and it bites it off as you go along. You tap in and tap out everywhere, and you only need one. Yep, you only need one. If you imagined that in Nottingham you want to get from A to B, and it means the tram and then a Nottingham City bus and then a Trent Barton bus and then maybe a train... You will need four tickets. So, you know, do you have four cars in your driveway? I'm going to Derby today, I'll use the red car. I'm going to Mansfield tomorrow, I'll have to use the blue car. Yep. I, uh, one of my oldest friends in Germany, um, I hope he's still alive, I've not heard from him for a while, he's well into his 80s, Helmut Boozer, who loved to introduce himself to people as Boozer by name and Boozer by nature. Um, <laughs> I used to go and see him a lot in Essen, and one time he insisted that I should go and stay with the family in their house in Bredenhai, a nice suburb served by tram, to the south of Essen. So I spend an entertaining weekend with family Boozer in Bredenheim, and there are four cars on the premises, three on the drive, one in the road outside. So, you know, car ownership, big thing, people like cars. So over dinner on the Friday evening, we have a very animated discussion about what people are doing the next day. Uh, Helmut has decided he's going to take me on a tour of the breweries in Dortmund, so we definitely weren't driving. 
His wife was going to visit a friend of hers who had recently been widowed, also in Dortmund, but well to the south of where we were going. She had one question for Helmut about the integration between the two tariffs of the Rhine-Ruhr region and the Rhine-Sieg region. Yep, so all good, that's all sorted. She's not driving. The daughter, 20-something, was going to visit a university friend in Koblenz, and she said, you know, Andrew, even though our railway fares are so high, they're about half what they were then, about half what they were in the UK. Um, I will not drive, I will take the train to see Liliana in Koblenz. And the son, uh, younger, not sure what he was doing, but he wasn't using a car either. So I said, what have you got these bloody cars for? You know, why? what have you got? Oh, they then all get very defensive about how useful a car is to do X or Y or Z. You know, I'm, uh, the son is saying, I've got a big box of papers I have to pick up from the university in Bonn. I must drive because I need this. You know, blah, blah, blah. But basically, they don't use their cars. Mrs. Thatcher made the fabulous mistake of saying the British were underprivileged because they owned fewer motor cars per head of population than the Germans. If, however, she looked at the use of motor cars, she would have been fascinated to discover that the Germans drive their cars between a third and a half the number of miles a year that we do. In that period, incidentally... There was a fabulous, some of you would have heard this story before, I apologise. There was a fabulous advertisement on German TV for the new 7 Series BMW, which had a scene of a nice house, probably like Helmut's house in Braden. I. It's dark, people have gone to bed. Sun rises, everybody wakes up in the morning. Front door of the house opens out, smart, out steps, smartly suited businessman with keys to 7 Series in his hand walks towards it, throws the keys in the air, puts them in his pocket, walks across the road and gets on a tram. And the byline that comes up in the advertisement from the great Bayern Motorwerk, BMW, is saying the man who is intelligent enough to buy this motor car is intelligent enough to know when not to use it. And I, I fell in love with that advert and I was determined to find out how, the, why, how, why the great BMW had done this. And eventually... With help from Mercedes-Benz, I track down the marketing director of BMW and I meet him in Stuttgart. In fact, I take him to lunch in Stuttgart at London Transport's expense. We sat in a fine restaurant in Stuttgart and I went through this love of this advert, etc. and why, whatever, you know. He said, yes, it's good. It's an environmental message. It's very powerful and it's very important to we Germans, the environment. You know, you, I don't think you've heard of it in the UK. True, we hadn't heard of it. <laughs> At that time, um, and I said, that's really, really interesting, but you sell that car in the UK. Okay, you've got the steering wheel on the other side, but it's the same car. You sell it in the UK. Why don't you advertise it that way in the UK? And he looked at me very thoughtfully and he said, I'm so sorry to have to say this, Mr. Brother. We were very formal. Even though you are from the great city of London, it is because your public transport is simply not good enough. <laughs> Tick the box. Tick the next box and the box after. It's true, isn't it? It's true. Can we ever change it? Pfft, I was 75 um, two weeks ago. I think I've now reached the point of saying, no, I, I don't think we ever can. We've had this you know, wonderful kerfuffle about let's not build HS2. Let's instead spend the £36 billion, look through the numbers, mainly on roads. In fact, I recommend you open up on the Department of Transport website, there's a thing called Network North, yeah, which tells you where all this money is going to be spent. Some of it's going to be spent on building a tram extension to Manchester Airport. <laughs> oh, hello, didn't that open in 2015? Some of it's going to be spent on a tram extension in Nottingham to Clifton South. <coughs> didn't that open in 2011? I mean, it's just eyewash, hogwash, the whole thing. It's bollocks my French once again but seriously um, it's promised that Leeds at long last will get a mass transit system whatever that's meant to mean you know buses with stripes or something uh, I, I don't think it'll happen we just we don't have we, we don't have the nous to understand public transport if you're going to um, and I thought about doing this once if you're going to become a public transport manager in Germany, you would have to have certain qualifications. You would have to have been to the Technische Hochschule for the Öffentliche Verkehrs, whatever. Um, some kind of qualification that doesn't exist in the UK, 
we have a couple of universities that are averagely good on transport. Loughborough, Aston, there may be one in Scotland, can't remember. <coughs> but they're not serious. They're not like the Technische Hochschule in Karlsruhe. You go there um, to become a qualified public transport person. You understand all these important things about coordination, integration, developing public transport links before you build the houses, all it rolls off the tongue. You know, steady. We've never done it. And I, I fear we never will. Thank you. <laughs> Is that good night? <laughs> Seriously, any more questions? No, good. Well done, that one. Well, no, I'd just like to thank you, Andrew, for a fascinating talk, a fascinating question and answer session. We learned a lot. And the one thing I'm going to take away is that none of what you said was either the French word or rubbish. Thank you very much. <laughs>